so I'm Beth. It's nice to see you all. I see many familiar faces. Today I'm getting to talk about really my favorite thing to talk about, uh, and that is nutrition in the media. So what I'm going to do is talk to you about some of the big challenges that we have, how we can sort of handle those challenges, and then if we have time, I think I have a whole hour, I think. Emily, you tell me when I need to start. Just give me the when I need to start winding it down but towards the end what I'm going to do in this presentation is give you all since most of you are dietitians or going to be dietitians right uh, give you some tips on handling the media I, what I'm hoping to do even though uh, I'm, I'm a little critical of the media here well, I'm, I'm hoping that in this talk I can inspire you all to get out there and be in the media. I know, Jennifer, you are very interested in that. You've probably already done some of that. So I'm really hoping to give you guys some tips on how to navigate that well and feel comfortable doing it. So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, nutrition news is everywhere, right? And people are really interested in it. But one of the big problems, as many of you realize, is that we see a lot of headlines that can be very confusing to people and also very scary to people, telling them that certain things are going to kill them. Uh, eating too much added sugar, this is a headline, uh, may be killing you. Uh, but also, um, low-fat diets will kill you as well. So will low-carb diets, though. Okay. So many, many things out there nutritionally that are going to kill us. Specific foods are, will also kill us. So not just these diets, but milk is bad for you. Scary science that shows that. But also cheese. Cheese is addictive. One doctor calls it dairy crack. Um, but what about meat? Meat is killing you as well. So you may be thinking, all right, so meat's killing me, dairy's killing me, maybe I'll just go vegan. Well, not so fast, <laughs> because fruit is bad for you too, and so are grains. What are you going to eat, right? Um, now, if you just wait around a little while, though, it does get better. Oh, wait, low carb versus low fat, new research says it really doesn't matter. And, you know, all that stuff we told you about red meat and cheese, nah, not really all that bad, not, not as bad as we previously thought. And full-fat dairy may actually benefit your heart health. And even pasta will help you to lose weight. Can you see why people are so confused with these headlines that we see out there? Um, here's another one. Seriously, juice is not healthy, and then a week later, is fruit juice bad for you? Not so fast. So... You can see why the public is so confused about nutrition because we see all of this stuff out there. Uh, back in, uh, I guess it was 2007, I went to a uh, public health conference and there was a journalism professor there named Gary Switzer. And Dr. Switzer was just starting this organization healthnewsreview.org because as a journalist he was very interested in medical journalism and he was seeing a lot of these same things you know these headlines these medical stories that were not reporting the science very accurately and he was very passionate about this and so he developed this organization um, that took a lot of healthcare professionals a lot of academics and what they were going to do is review stories on TV and then also in the print media. And they have this whole series, I won't read each of these, but they had a very distinct set of criteria that they were using and they were going to rank these stories based on these criteria. And then you can see all the different criteria there. You can still go to this website. It was going pretty strongly for a while. Um, sadly, in the last couple of years, they haven't been able to get funding and they've had to really pare down what they've been doing, uh, which is, to me a very sad commentary on the state of this and you can see there's a teeny tiny picture of Gary Schwitzer right there and you can see this website now over the years as they uh, a couple of interesting things like over the years as they started to compile these reviews of all these different health stories one of the things that was very interesting is after the first couple of years they stopped reviewing TV medical news stories because they were so bad that there and with no sign of getting better one of their one of their goals with this was hoping that that uh, the media themselves the media journalists would pay attention to this and sort of 
change, right? And get a little bit better at this than what they found with TV. And that wasn't happening. So they just sort of ditched that and focused on print journalism. Now, this is very interesting. You can look at this compilation of their stories and look at sort of the averages. And so after they had been doing this for, for several years, they started to look at the averages. And what they found after over 2,600 total reviews, out of five stars, the average ranking was 3.1. And this was for a variety of different news organizations. So CNN, MSN, uh, Fox News, NPR, all these different outlets that you can look at. Here are just, here's just a smattering of them. You can go through and you can look at all the individual news organizations and see how they rank. We're just going to look at a few. CNN, they actually averaged a little bit better than the overall average at an average of 3.36 stars. Fox News, and uh, notice the total of reviews is only uh, is, is only 40, so that sort of can sway that, but uh, their average was below uh, with over half of their stories being ranked at two stars. NPR, a little bit better than the average, 3.4, so they, they do okay, but probably not where you'd want them to be. And then this source, I don't know if anybody uh, reads Vox. Anybody read Vox? There, there's a really wonderful, several really good, but one in particular, um, journalist there, her name is Julia Belouz, and she does an outstanding job of nutrition and medical journalism. Um, and so I, I actually use a lot of her news stories um, uh, for my students, for my undergraduate students, when I want them to read some really good medical journalism. She does an outstanding job. And you can see they actually, now notice only 26 reviews, so it's a little skewed there, but they actually score really, really well. They've got some very, very good journalism there so I would advise that you go there so for a lot of these headlines yes we can blame the media but who else should we be blaming for this it's not really just the media's fault that we're seeing this celebrity doctors right we have a lot of celebrity doctors out there who are uh, enjoy their celebrity enjoy the media and uh, they are putting out a lot of bad information this was a publication from 2014 some researchers actually reviewed 40 randomly selected episodes from Dr. Oz. And this is what they found. Um, evidence supported about 46% of their recommendations. Now, if you read this, this article, evidence, what, what did evidence constitute? They were pretty liberal with that, if there was even like a case study that supported it. So evidence, and, and they even say this in the article, if you pull this article, they say, we were pretty liberal with our definition of evidence. So this 46%, some of that evidence is not the strongest, things like case studies, but at least there was something there. Evidence contradicted actually 15%, no evidence for 39% of the recommendations that they made. On average, they make 12 recommendations per show. <laughs> <laughs> and that's and that's a show every day. How do you do that? You know, think about if you were doing that show, um, and you were g g doing a show on this like every day. You know, twelve recommendations, thirty nine percent of which were dietary nutrition advice, um, and they only described the magnitude of the the effect for seventeen percent. So telling people exactly how much of an effect whatever this advice was going to give. So this is pretty bad. This is from 2014. I don't know if it's improved or, or gotten worse. I had a patient one day in my clinic and she said, you know, I used to watch Dr. Oz all the time and it just exhausted me. And she said, I just don't even watch it anymore because it's impossible to do all of the stuff that he tells you to do. And she said, I'm just exhausted. So she stopped watching it. I thought that was, that was pretty interesting. Other doctors you know, come out with, with books. You see a lot of books by doctors. Uh, the Cheese Trap, again, it's that whole uh, cheese is um, uh, like dairy crack. Wheat Belly, Grain Brain, all of these books that come out that tell you that these foods are you know, bad for you. And they're very compelling. If you read them and you don't have a strong science background, they're, they're very convincing. If you look at them with an unbiased critical eye, though, what you'll find is that a lot of these use um, 
some very sketchy evidence to support their claims, but it's very appealing to the public. Um, just, the, just, just this week, um, to give you an example, I, I, I see this in the media, but then I see it reflected in a lot of my patients. Just this past week, I had a patient who, um, she eats half an orange in the morning because when she eats a whole orange, she thinks that the orange is causing her to have increased insulin secretion that then makes her feel shaky. And so she's only eating half an orange in the morning. And so that's that, that hypothesis. You hear this a lot. I've even seen it in nutrition textbooks that you know, if you eat sugar on an empty stomach, you're gonna over secrete insulin and it's gonna drop your blood sugar, right? Have you heard that before? Uh, I have looked all over PubMed, everywhere, there's no study that supports that that happens in the average person, none. But I hear that all the time. Um, and what's most likely causing her feeling shaky is not getting enough fuel for, and then, then she goes out and goes for a run and her BMI is 18. Um, this is what I see. So I see this reflected in my patients sometimes um, and I actually have seen, just in the past week, I've seen several patients who are actually malnourished uh, because they're following some really kind of kooky dietary advice. People with low hemoglobin, somatocrits, low albumin because they're on some very extreme diets. And so you, you start to see this actually reflected in patients. Um, is it just celebrity doctors? Is it just the media? Academia is starting to get into the act now too with some really bad press releases coming out of academic universities. One of the things that that Health uh, News Review started to do, they actually started to review press releases. So not just news stories, but press releases coming out of universities to see were their press releases uh, accurately reflecting the studies that they were putting out? And the media uses these press releases a lot uh, to report, right? Have you seen that? Where yeah, the press release, basically, sometimes the news story is just the press release. So they may not be doing their due diligence. So they rely on these. These need to be accurate. So Health News Review started reviewing them. And... Um, some pretty bad ones out there. This one from University of Maryland uh, claiming that chocolate milk improves concussion uh, uh, symptoms. And the study did not show that. But again, they wanted to get that media attention. So this is, this is pretty bad when, when you've got academics doing this. We've seen, um, th this is an interesting thing to do, is go on, on some of the retraction websites to see what studies have been retracted. Uh, Brian Wansink was a, was a professor at uh, Cornell and was putting out a lot of this very high profile research. He did a lot of research on food marketing, food behaviors, nudges. You've heard of nudges, right? With um, what can nudge people towards healthier, uh, healthier behaviors. And he had 17 papers retracted had to resign from Cornell because a lot of the stuff that he was putting out uh, when they actually looked and reanalyzed his data didn't turn out to be true. He's doing a lot of p-hacking, a lot of data phishing. This was one of his studies, The Joy of Cooking Too Much, 70 Years of Calorie Increases in Classic Recipes. When they went back and reanalyzed it, his conclusions were not accurate. Um, and so, again, 17 retractions and he had to resign from um, Cornell. This is an interesting place to go if you have some extra time <laughs> and you just want to kind of look and see what's out there. Go to, go to retractiondatabase.org and you can see um, who's getting retracted and why. It's kind of, kind of interesting, kind of a fun thing to do in your abundant spare time, right? So what effect does this have? Well, then you see headlines like this coming out. And I've been doing this for a really long time. I was where you guys are back in the 80s. And um, so when I started uh, my internship, it was in the early days, and, and that was when we talked a lot about cholesterol. We told people not to eat shrimp and lobster because they were high in cholesterol. And that's when we thought cholesterol in foods had a direct effect. And so we had to change a lot of the things that we said. So I look back on what I learned and what I taught, and it's changed dramatically. But as you can see, look at some of these headlines. Why everything we know about diet and nutrition is wrong. <laughs> and so 
That's what happens. Uh, the FDA's phony nutrition science. So they're demonizing the FDA. They're demonizing nutritionists. What the government got wrong about nutrition and how it can fix it. Now, there's some element of truth to some of these, right? But is, is it really as bad as that headline makes it sound? Is everything we know about nutrition wrong? Did the FDA completely get everything wrong? I don't think that's very accurate. Um, what kind of effect does this have? You know, anecdotally, as I already told you, I see this in my patients in a real way. What, but are, are there studies that kind of support that? And this was a study that was published in 2014. And what these researchers did is they sampled US adults and asked them about conflicting nutrition information. And those who reported exposure to conflicting, oh yes, I'm sorry, go ahead. Um, so if someone were to come to you and like say that they heard something in the media, what would you tell them? Yeah, that's, you, you should take my counseling class because <laughs> I cover that in, in counseling. Um, and so, yeah, what do we do in that situation? And, and that's a whole lecture in and of itself. How do we communicate to people? And so one of the ways that, you know, we have to be very careful not to say, oh, that's wrong. That's ridiculous that you're doing that because you can really push people into resistance, right? And they're hearing this. And so what I often do is I ask people, you know, how do you feel about what you're doing? Um, are you, um, where, where did you hear that? And can you tell me some more about that? And I kind of dive into that. And then I ask them permission. I ask them permission. Do you, do you want some more information about that? Can I talk to you about that? And if they say no, then I don't. Uh, my other patient that I had this week who, um, this is my um, patient, I think she's 80 and she was doing, she had given up all meat, all dairy, had lost a lot of weight. She had gone from 120 down to 90 pounds. Some of this had to do with being in the hospital. There are a lot of complicating issues here. But she was really cutting out all of these foods from her diet because she had heard they were unhealthy. And I was in a situation where I have all her labs and she was concerned about her weight loss. So that's a nice opening there to say, yeah, you're concerned about your weight loss. She had her son with her, which helped as well, because he had seen these behaviors and was concerned about them. And then I also had her labs, you know, of albumin that was low, uh, low hematocrit, low hemoglobin. And so I could take that information and say, hey, you know, I'm concerned that some of these markers of your nutritional health are low and they're concerning to me. Can we talk about that? She was very concerned about her weight loss, wanted to gain some of that weight back. And so that was an opening. Can we talk about that? And then luckily she had said, I have started to add back chicken and eggs. And so that was really helpful. And I said, oh, you know, that's really, that's really great that you're doing that. I think that's going to help you. She also had very low energy levels. So all of those were openings for me to say, can we talk about this? I also had an ongoing relationship with her because she's been coming to our clinic for a while. So she trusted me. And so building that trust helps. So we're moving along and she's, and she's improving. So yeah, um, one of the things that I always really stress to you guys, and we're going to talk about this a little bit towards the end, is valuing patient autonomy, asking permission. Those things build trust, and if people trust you, then that's like your best, your, your, your best tool. I hope that helped. We'll talk a lot about that a little more at the end. It's a very good question. So this study, published in 2014, what this study showed was that not only did exposure to these conflicting messages confuse people, look at that last bullet point. It was associated with greater confusion, um, I mean, with, uh, with greater backlash. So they had negative, negative feelings towards the nutrition expert community. Um, but here's the, even the more concerning thing. It was inversely associated with intentions to engage in healthy behaviors. So I think this shows us that potentially these conflicting messages are doing real damage. They do real damage. And so what, the reason I like to talk about this so much, particularly to nutrition professionals, is that one person cannot fix this. <laughs> we all need to be out there sending out accurate evidence-based messages. And so that's why I'm very passionate about talking about this. And I, th I know many of you are too, because you've talked to me about this. Um, another example, 
Here's a really good one, especially this is a pediatric conference, so I like to throw this in because this has to do with children. Uh, I think we'd all agree, right, that cutting back on added sugar is good, right? But we have to make our messages accurate about this. This was an article, ADHD kids, get rid of the sugar, add yoga, and try this new technology to calm the mind. Well, if you read this article, the article is actually about some really interesting research looking at biofeedback with brain waves that can help possibly uh, help children with behavioral issues with ADHD. It's not a study on sugar. It's not a study on yoga. Now, is doing yoga with kids a bad thing? No, but shouldn't we be reporting this accurately? Do we have evidence that doing yoga helps ADHD? You know, that's what we have to look at. And what about the evidence on uh, sugar? Come on. No, it's not working. Can somebody help me? <laughs> I don't know if the battery's low or what's going on. Maybe I turned it off. Yeah, I was pressing the right button. I'll have to go up there and just change it manually, and then I'll run back. I'll just run back and forth. Oh! That works. Oh, there we go. Okay, thank you. And so if you, again, we would all agree that sugar is something that particularly children, if they're getting too much, should cut back on. But when we look at the evidence so far, and that is so far with the evidence that we have, there is no association between sugar consumption and the incidence of ADHD. So we have to report these things accurately. Uh, yes, Jenny. Mm -hmm. which is complicated, p-values, studies, yeah. and everything, that probably is, we are not making a good job on very, very Could so be. It, it, it could be, yes. And, and so that's a really good, good comment. Scientific papers are hard. But can we teach people to... Um, evaluate them better? I think we can. And even if people don't understand p-values, which is a really hard concept, it's very hard to describe a p-value in accurate t terminology without getting into some pretty heavy scientific concepts, I think. Um, however, I think that we can teach the media and even the public how to, how to look at a paper. You always have limitations, right? Absolutely. Yeah, and, and I look at some of these articles and I think if that journalist had just read the limitation section of your paper, that would tell them a lot. So what I do when I talk to journalists and other people, I give them, and I'm gonna show you th this to you, they're sort of a bare bones toolkit. You may not get Jenny's paper, because Jenny's pretty scientific, and you may not get all of her statistics, but you can at least pick out some basics of study design, limitations. There are some basics that you can pick up on. And I'm gonna talk about these with you guys from the perspective of you as a dietitian talking to a reporter, because a reporter's gonna call you, and they're gonna say, I need this in the next hour. And Jennifer might be going, but I need to analyze that whole study and I need to understand all the statistics. I would argue, no, you don't. You don't need to understand everything at the level that Jenny would understand her paper. You can pick out some basic things and give a very intelligent, accurate reflection of that without knowing every little minutia of that. Because that's a challenge and that's what's gonna happen to you um, and it's what turns off a lot of people in, in nutrition to talking to the media because they want it for their evening broadcast. And that's not gonna change. You can't say, oh, can you just do the story tomorrow night? No, they can't. They're gonna do it tonight and if you're not the person they're gonna talk to, they'll find somebody to talk to. I would rather it be you than somebody who's less qualified, okay? And we'll talk about how you can pair that down, but you're making a really good point, 
Yeah, it's hard. It's hard. And one of the problems, too, and I'm getting ahead of myself, is that it used to be with news organizations, they had dedicated medical health reporters. They don't do that anymore. We'll talk about that when we get to that section. And so it does make it harder. But yeah, you're right, Jenny, but I also think that they can do better and they can learn how to read your highly scientific paper and at least get some accuracy out of it. Yeah. So write your limitations section really well, right? Because <laughs> I've, I've seen these journal, I've seen these, you know, newspaper articles, like if they just read that limitation section, <laughs> it would have helped. All right, so this is your toolkit, okay? So these are the things that I always tell my students, I tell journalists, I tell everybody. These are the things, kind of the low-hanging fruit that you can pick out pretty quickly and talk with some some accuracy. So these are the biggies where I see mistakes. Misinterpreting study design, exaggerating study findings, um, looking at outcome measures. What are the outcome measures that we're looking at and what can we accurately say about that? So a lot of this, it's not that there's a problem with the research, it's what are we saying about it? It's not that the research is, sometimes the research is Brad, like we saw with Brian Wansink, but sometimes it's that we're not using the proper words and words matter. Um, statistical versus clinical significance and then our own personal biases. We all have certain ways that we eat that work for us, right? It's not gonna work for everybody and that's a hard thing to, for all of us to overcome. So asking the right questions, that reporter calls you, what should you start looking at? So let's start with looking at, we're gonna look at all of these things, but let's start with looking at study design. Pretty easy to do, right? You guys know how to do that. What's the study design and what can we say about that study design accurately? So let's look at a lot of the studies that you'll see reported on out there are either lab, animal research, or they're observational. What can we accurately say about these? Well, let's start with looking at animal studies. And I see this a lot on Facebook. Do you see somebody saying on Facebook, oh, look at this, you know, they're gonna cure Alzheimer's, they're gonna cure cancer because of this. And then you look at it and it was an animal study. How often, in, in medicine, does an animal study actually translate into um, in, in human clinical trials? And this is an older evaluation. They published this in 2006, but at that time, about 37% translated. Okay, so animal studies, uh, I always argue that an animal study should not be reported on in the health section of a newspaper or a, a website or wherever. That goes in the science section. That's my personal feeling. There's a science section, there's a health section. Animal studies, we are talking about health, most of the time we're talking about human health. Rats don't read websites. Um, so that's my feeling on that. Uh, but when you look at headlines, do they always make that very clear. Look at this headline. Early cow's milk consumption may cut breast cancer risk. All right, so you're thinking, oh, right in humans, you would think that, right? Okay. But look at the first, at least this was in the first sentence. A lot of times it's buried deeper in. In their study, pregnant rats were randomly assigned, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Um, rats are not humans. So again, is that headline warranted? I don't think so. It should have said early cow's milk consumption in rats. Uh, here's an example of a researcher misrepresenting their own research. Uh, this is a direct quote from this researcher from Yale, and he says, our discovery implies that humans frequently ingesting low-calorie sweet products in a state of hunger may be more likely to relapse and choose high-calorie alternatives in the future. That was what he put out to the media reflecting his study. His study was done in mice. It doesn't imply, even using the word imply like that makes it okay, implies, no, it doesn't even imply. It wasn't in humans. We can't imply from that, okay? What it means is maybe we need to do more research on this in humans. That's what that means. Um, do you guys remember all the stuff about high fructose corn syrup? 
right? That was one of the big things in the last, I don't know, five, ten years, where high fructose corn syrup was you know, supposed to be worse for us than sugar, right? How did that happen? Because um, it's not. But how, how did we get there? Well, a lot of this came out of some pretty high profile endocrinologists, researchers, doctors who were putting this out there to the public and doing some YouTube videos on it that again, if you didn't know your biochemistry, you would go, oh wow, that sounds really convincing. And when I heard this, I was like, wow, you know, when I was in school, we learned that fructose is handled differently, but actually m might raise blood sugar less, but you know, Essentially, we treat it the same. And so what you saw out there is that people were saying, well, when you get too much fructose, it gets shuttled into um, de novo lipogenesis. So instead of getting used for energy, stored as glycogen, it's going right into producing fat. And this is a huge problem. And this is why we have this obesity problem. Now that's true. In animal models, about 50% of fructose does get shuttled into fat. But animal physiology with carbohydrates is very different from human. And when you look at humans, less than 3% of the fructose is shuttled directly into de novo lipogenesis, unless you really push the outer envelope of that. And so this really took hold, right? This was like a big topic. Everybody was talking about how, oh, if we just get rid of high fructose corn syrup, we're going to solve the whole obesity epidemic. And so this was one area that, um, that this really uh, took, took fire, but it just does not work that way in humans. And we're going to touch back on this in, in, in just a little while. Um, a lot of studies that we see are observational. And again, I've been around a long time, and I remember back uh, when we used to talk about vitamin E supplementation, that it might lower the risk of heart disease. And you guys may not even remember that, because it was a while back. But t some of you might remember that. Do we do that anymore? You no, know, you don't hear people doing that because those studies were observational and then subsequent randomized controlled trials show that it really didn't have an effect. And then you also had a lot of people over supplementing with vitamin E and having issues with bleeding uh, when they went in for surgery and you had surgeons having to tell people, you know, if they were coming in for surgery, please go off your high dose vitamin E before you come in for surgery. And so we see this a lot with observational studies. Uh, again, here's that low fat diet could kill you. Um, associations are not causation. They're not. And I cannot tell you, again, when you've been doing this a long time, how many things I have seen that everybody thought was going to be the next big thing because some observational data pointed to it, and then it turned out not to be so. It happens a lot. Vitamin E is just one, uh, just one example of that. And a lot of this started back with people looking at this data, this correlational data uh, that these two things sort of happened at the same time. You see an increase in high fructose corn syrup. We sh started using more high fructose corn syrup instead of just straight sugar, and obesity levels went up. But does that mean that one of those caused the other? You can look at these other types of what we call spurious associations. This is showing you increase in bottled water consumption and obesity. Those two things correlate too, okay? But is there any reason that drinking more bottled water would increase obesity? Of course not. Now, you can argue, well, it makes more sense, right, for high fructose corn syrup to cause it. And yes, that's true. But this basic assumption is still something that needs to be challenged because it could be no true causation there, okay? So yeah, it makes more sense, but the, but the, the conclusion should be maybe we should look into this, not... These two are definitely related. And you can go to this really fun website on spurious associations where they crunch all these numbers and they show you all these crazy things that have associations that, of course, you know, would have no relationship. Well, it's kind of fun. And it kind of helps you to make a good, a good point. So we look at, I like to use uh, fructose and high fructose corn syrup. How did this get so out of hand with this? Well, a lot of the studies were in rats, as we already saw. A lot of the studies used pure fructose in them. We really very rarely eat 
pure fructose. Uh, high fructose corn syrup in sodas is a, a kind of a 45, 55, 50, 50. It's not all fructose. So, so, so that's an issue as well. A lot of the studies that you would see would compare high fructose corn syrup beverages to something like water and not sugar. Well, how can you say it's worse than sugar if you're not comparing it to sugar? You're comparing it to water. Of course it's going to be worse than water, right? It's still sugar. Um, and then a lot of the studies were not randomized controlled trials. Now you can say, well, what's the big deal? Right? We shouldn't be eating a lot of high fructose corn syrup. That's not a bad message to get across to consumers. Well, truth matters because then you had, and this even came from some of these researchers, uh, endocrinologists out that, that were saying, fruit is bad for us. Now, is that, does that make any sense at all? That <laughs> we should tell people not to eat fruit because of the fructose? But for a while there, there were messages coming out that maybe we were eating too much fruit and that was bad for us. And that's pretty ridiculous, right? Uh, so fruit got sort of demonized there for a while. The other un uh, unintentional or intentional consequence, you can look at it in different ways, is that then food companies started promoting their foods that used real sugar, like it was better. Right? Look at this Mountain Dew throwback made with real sugar. So not high fructose corn syrup, but real sugar. Like that's better for you? It's ridiculous, right? They're both, they're both, you know, something that we should limit, most of us, right? So this is what happens. So this is why a lot of times people say to me, well, Beth, does it really matter because we should reduce high fructose corn syrup anyway? And I believe it does matter because this is, these are the kinds of things that happen, okay? And again, the message was that high fructose corn syrup was worse than sugar. Well, they're pretty much all the same, right? So study design, pretty easy thing to drill down to, right? You can look at Jenny's complicated paper and probably get just from the abstract, was it a randomized control trial? Was it done in animals? Was it an observational study? That's not a hard thing to do. And then Jennifer, you can tell the media, I'm sorry I'm picking on you, but you're one of me, I know you. Um, you. Jennifer can say, well, you know what? This was an observational study. It cannot show causation. It's interesting, but we have to be very careful. That's a very accurate thing that she can say. She didn't have to go and read every word of Jenny's paper, right? It's a pretty easy thing to ask her to. Oh, I'm lost there again. Sorry. Thanks. So again, that's an area that's pretty easy to Thank you. I know. <laughs> Remember when we used to use slides? We used to haul our slide projectors and our slide sets along. I, I just found a folder of uh, overhead projector film that I uh, finally threw those out. Yeah, still had them in a file. We were just talking about this this morning. There it goes. I, I see it coming back up over there. That's a good sign. But is it coming up on the? Any questions why we're waiting? <laughs> yes? What is the best way to be respectfully assertive with another dietitian if they... Ooh. Did you hear Jennifer's question? What is a good way to be respectfully assertive with another dietitian that you're seeing bad information coming out from? That was kind of Harriet's question that she was asking. She said, how do you, how do you respectfully assert with another dietitian? Because we see dietitians out there too. We talked about celebrity doctors, but there are also dietitians. Um, in, in what context are we talking about? On social media? Uh, like in the clinic. In the clinical setting, um, yeah, I mean, a lot of times just a personal conversation with somebody. I mean, I would not say something maybe in front of a patient, um, but yeah, that's, that's a toughie. Anybody have any ideas? What would you do? What do you think? 
That's a good question. I was trying to like explain like most recent studies, but she just kept kind of turning them down. Yeah, I mean you can't you can't force it on people, and that's why. Um, what? Uh, yeah. Um, I mean, I, I even did like the illicit provider. Yeah. I, you. You know. I. I think at some point, um, I'm going to sound like Frozen now. We have to let it go <laughs> uh, um, because we can't. Uh, this is something that I've had to learn: is that I can't control everything. I can't control everything. And so, what I would say to you and anyone else that is, is particularly passionate about this is, make your own presence. And a lot of times, if I hear somebody else doing that, then I'll just I'll blog on it. I'll do a TV segment on it. I'll go, oh, okay, well, you know what? I'm going to fight it over here and put out accurate information about it on my own platform. Now, it'll be a lot better if it's somebody working for you, right? Because then you can say, look, you know, we do evidence-based. We do evidence base here, and this is really important that we do that. If it's a colleague, it's a lot harder, you're right. And, but opening up that conversation, but your illicit provider illicit is really good, but you can't, you know, at some point, you can't, you can't convince everybody, right? So, yeah, it's a really good question. Anybody else have any comments on that? Oh, yay, we're back. Any other? Yeah, yeah. We're a little further back, but that's okay. I can speed through. Okay, so we're here. So we talked about this, talked about this. I think I have to keep it going. It doesn't like to have too much rest. I think the power is yeah. the power was. Oh, okay, okay, great, okay. So study design, again, low-hanging fruit. That's like the first thing I always tell people to look at and comment on in the media. Okay, so the next thing, numbers matter. And this is where we get into some of those more difficult things like Jenny talked about with statistics. And so this is where having a good working knowledge of statistics is important. One of the things you're going to see a lot of out there, and this is whether it's an observational study or a randomized controlled trial, but it's worse with observational studies. Because first of all, you've got the observational study that's only showing a correlation. So you've got that weakness. So we don't even know if it's causation. And then on top of that, we've got these kind of usually weak relative risks, okay? So here's relative risk versus absolute risk. New wonder drug reduces risk of heart attack by 50%. That sounds big, 50%. Does that sound like a big number? Think about a consumer thinking about that, all right? But here's the absolute risk, which is very rarely reported. You know, usually it's relative risk that's reported. New wonder drug reduced heart attacks from two per 100 to one per 100, okay? Is 50% accurate? It's accurate, but it's misleading, okay? And so this is very important. Now, that does not mean that we don't use that drug. If you're a clinician reducing from two to one, you know, we have all of these numbers needed to treat, all these different ways of looking at it, that we would say, well, it's still a useful drug, but we have to, you know, again, take this into account. Now, when we look at it in the perspective of nutrition and some other things, it really gets muddier. Um, I got very interested in this when th this is actually a real question that I had many years ago. This happened, I think, in the early 2000s. One of my patients from clinic called me and she said, she was on hormone replacement therapy, and she said, Beth, I just watched the news, and there's this really scary report that said women who are on hormone replacement are twice as likely to die from ovarian cancer than women who are not. She's on hormone replacement therapy. because so that really scared her. And and, you know, our doctors had said, you know, yeah, you know, for right now, you can stay on this. It's good for your bones. So this might be of benefit to you. But then she sees this, right? Well, this, I went and I said, okay, let me find the study and I'll get back to you. So I went and found the actual study. Well, the actual risk, yeah, it went from 1% to 2%. Was that a doubling? Yes. Now, when I told her that, now, as a, a person may look at that and say, well, okay, I still want to go off of the hormone replacement therapy. That's fine. That's absolutely fine. But at least they're getting accurate information. Is that a lot less scary than that top number? 
a doubling of the risk, oh, my risk goes from a 1% risk not on the hormone replacement therapy to 2%. It kind of tamps down that emotion. And then at least the person can make a decision based on more accurate information. So this relative risk is what we see a lot. And again, and again put that on top of that, a lot of times the studies are observational. It's sort of a double weakness there. So the way that I kind of talk about relative risk with my students is it's like having this coupon. I gave you a coupon for 30% off, but I don't tell you what it's for. You get 30% off of something. And you're like, okay, what do I get 30% off of? Was it a Lexus or a bag of M&Ms? Okay. Now, probably none of us in here can afford Alexa, right? We're nutritionists. <laughs> um, so, uh, but the 30% off of the Lexus, you're going to be saving a lot of money, right? Spending a lot of money, but you'll be saving a lot of money. Whereas the M&Ms, are you going to run off to the CVS to get that bag of M&Ms for 30% off? Maybe you will, but maybe you won't, okay? So it's a big difference there. And so that's basically what relative risk is. To give you some more sort of um, uh, a level of understanding uh, these percentages. So here's that same study that I quoted earlier. Low-fat diet could kill you. So first of all, it's observational, so no causation shown. A 28% increased risk. That's a relative risk of 1.28. So a, a, a risk of 1.0 is even, right? No difference between the groups. So if it's Above a one, there's an increased risk. If it's below a one, there's decreased risk. So that, that 0.28 above a one represents a 28% increased risk. Now does that, think about it from a consumer perspective. If you're a consumer reading this, you say 28%, does that sound like a lot? To most people, they probably be, that would be somewhat compelling. So let's look at an area that we would all agree. Does everybody agree that smoking is a cause of lung cancer? Have they ever done a randomized control trial to show that, to show causation? You're not gonna randomize people to smoke, are you? No IRB would pass that. It all comes from observational studies. There are observational studies where the evidence is so strong that we can draw causation. But look at the risk. That's not a typo. The relative risk for smoking in small cell lung cancer is 21.7. That's an increased relative risk of over 2,000%. Okay? That's pretty compelling, right? What do we see with nutrition studies? You know, 50%, 20%, 2,000% is a lot. <laughs> but that's hard to get across to the public, right? So again, smoking, yeah, we can pretty safely say without a randomized controlled trial that it causes lung cancer. So this is a nice little schematic that I use to sort of give people an idea. I give this to my students to say, okay, because it's kind of hard to really teach my undergrads how to actually calculate relative risk. It's a complicating thing. So I use this quick and dirty kind of method that a, um, a weak reduced risk 0.7 to 0.9, that would be a 10% to 30% reduced risk, right? So that's pretty weak. It's there, but it's weak. 10% to 50%, so you see up to 50% on the increased risk. That's actually considered to be a weak association. Now these are general. You have to go a little bit beyond this. This is pretty crude stuff that I'm showing you here because a lot more goes into it. It depends on what the starting risk is. But this is kind of a good kind of starting point to use. And then you can see moderate, strong, and very strong would be um, a, a relative risk of 7.0. That's basically um, you know, 690% increased risk. Okay, does that make sense? So, so this kind of helps my undergrads to kind of get a sense of this. So again, going back to Jenny's thing, I could show this, I could sort of teach um, a journalist this and say, you know, when you see this, you know, realize it's relative risk and teach them how to recognize it. That's a relative risk, not an absolute risk. So we have to say, is this strong? And that's what I'm not seeing in these headlines. They'll say 50% increased risk, but nobody comments on whether that's a big or little risk. And so you as a dietitian could say, you know, that might sound like a lot, but it's really not, right? So that lays some, some um, 
some actual um, comment on that. So again, the randomized control trial, this is the ultimate, right? But we don't do a whole lot of these, they're expensive. And so um, even here though, we can have, we, we need to look at the statistics pretty carefully. Now this is where I wanna talk a little bit about um, clinical significance versus statistical significance because in a lot of these these uh, newspaper website articles you'll see oh it was statistically significant right and so the average consumer is going to go oh that that means a lot well we know the statistical significance sometimes it's meaningful is it sometimes it's statistical but it's not that impressive here's a really good example and this is an example that I did way, way back when, when I started doing a lot of television, I reported on this on TV and I, I didn't look at the study. I just looked at the, what, was, what they were saying in newsletters and all that sort of thing. And it was about, uh, let me go back here, it was about this Minute Maid Heartwise orange juice that had these stanol esters in them that can lower um, uh, blood cholesterol, okay? And so they did a really nice, Minute Maid funded this really good study, control group versus study group. And I reported on it and said, oh yeah, you guys, this, this orange juice can help you to lower your LDLs, which are the bad cholesterol, so that's a good thing. Well, when I really looked at the study, I kind of thought, you know, I needed to be a little bit less enthusiastic about this because while it did lower LDLs and it was statistically significant, look at the lowering. It went from 145 to 139. That's not bad, but is that huge? And guess how much orange juice they had to drink every day? Two cups. You know, some people can, two cups is fine, but would some people, would that be kind of a lot of extra calories maybe? Maybe we shouldn't be telling people, maybe a cup a day is okay, but two cups, eh, maybe not so much. And so we always have to do that, looking at clinical judgment and talking about, yeah, okay, so it was just, it was statistically significant. And this is, happens a lot in weight loss studies where you'll see, oh, the keto diet or the low fat diet, the owner's diet, whatever, you know, was, was better than this other diet. Well, by how much because a lot of times it's a couple pounds right so yeah we've got to start putting amounts in here and saying this is how much it did it by and being really honest about that chocolate you know people eating chocolate for the health benefits dark chocolate so good for you because it has these flavanols in it well yeah but look at how much you would have to eat to get the amount of flavanols that would be clinically beneficial for dark chocolate you'd have to eat almost five ounces a day a lot of the studies are using cocoa supplements that are engineered to have higher amounts of these flavanols should we be out there telling people to eat chocolate for the health benefits i eat chocolate i eat dark chocolate every day because i like it that's fine but should we be telling people you should be eating more of this for your heart health I'm not sure that's a really accurate message that we should be sending out there now this last thing and this is another one that I think journalists people can really get this is the other thing that I tell people to look at what was the outcome measure that they used and so you've got these intermediate measures and a lot of studies use these intermediate measures because you can look at these over the course of months or years and finish your study right they're not necessarily bad it's what we say about them that's important I'm going to use an osteoporosis example here because that's the that's the uh, clinic that I work in and where my area of interest is many many years ago some data was coming out that fluoride supplements were really boosting bone density we got real excited about that wouldn't that be neat if we could just have people take fluoride get stronger bones that'd be very exciting but the problem was is that it did not decrease the number of fractures the people on the fluoride were breaking bones at the same prevalence that the people not on the supplements were. Is that useful? Do we put somebody on something that doesn't reduce fractures? No. Now we still look at bone density increases. That's something that's very useful. But what I'm saying here is that what do we say about that then? Do we tell people to take this and it will reduce your fractures? No. We say this increases bone density. We don't know yet if it lowers fracture risk. It might, but we don't have that data. So it's not that these are useless. What can you say about them? accurately so heart disease uh, I see a lot of studies that look at um, 
you know, vascular health, uh, vascular elasticity. Um, I, and, and then people make these kind of um, assumptions that it's gonna lower the risk of heart disease. You won't have a heart attack. Well, no, change to what was happening in the blood vessels. Increasing HDLs, decreasing LDLs, those are great markers. Do we know that then the effect is going to be to decrease whether you had a heart attack or not? Unless they measured that, we don't really know that. Okay, so that's really important to look at that. In obesity, you'll see a lot of studies that say, well, this supplement or doing this increased hunger or decreased hunger. Okay, that's interesting. How does it affect weight? If they didn't measure it, you can't say that it did it. Okay, so always look at what was measured. Again, it doesn't make it a bad study. It should be, what do you then say about it? Okay, this decreased hunger, it may help lower weight, but we don't know that for sure, okay? So these are all very, very important things. So what is the outcome? We see a lot with artificial sweeteners, where people say, oh, they're gonna make you gain weight. Well, the studies that show that tend to be studies that talk about, they're either observational, and the weight was higher, or they talk about things like, well, we measured hunger, and the people that got the artificial sweeteners were hungrier than the people who did not, okay? That's interesting. But what does it do to weight? And if you look at randomized control trials, and they are out there that compare beverages with artificial sweeteners, a good study would show a regular soda or a, a sugar-sweetened beverage, a diet soda, and then water, right? You would probably have three experimental or three arms of that study to actually show what you wanted to show. And when you look at well-done studies, this one actually done by uh, Holly and Jim from our department before they came here, when you look at studies that look at weight outcomes, what you see is that they don't make your weight go up. Okay, and that's what you care about. And so what are we going to say honestly about them? Now I'm not a, I drink a Diet Coke maybe a couple times a week, but am I gonna tell my patient that that's bad for their weight? You know, I'm not gonna do that because it's not accurate, okay? Um, so really think about outcome measures, statistics, study design. These are kind of the low hanging fruit that if the media comes to you, I do recommend pulling the actual study. That I do recommend. I learned my lesson from that kind of the hard way with that orange juice study. It was sort of after that experience that I had with that that I decided I would never comment on anything that I did not have the original journal article to look at. And I've strayed from that almost never over the past 10, 15 years from that. If I don't have the original study, I'm not talking about it. Okay, because I want to see it. I don't want to see somebody else's assessment of it. I want to assess it. Okay, so let's talk. Do we have time? I'm a little sure. It's okay, we'll, we'll, we'll try to get through this quickly. So expertise, I love this cartoon. I know nothing about the subject, but I'm happy to give you my expert opinion. <laughs> I see this a lot with the media interviewing. Uh, years ago, I saw um, a, uh, a news story about a weight loss study, and they were interviewing an ER surgeon about it. <laughs> I'm like, what does, an, what does an emergency room surgeon know about weight loss studies? And it was just kind of ridiculous. It was the only person they could get a hold of, probably, right? And that go back. That, that goes back to my point. This is why we need, even if we feel uncomfortable, it's better to be us than, than them, right? So these are some guidelines, and I will make these slides available so you don't have to write all of these down, but these are some guidelines um, from Health and Human Services about the news media. And the gist of this is, is that we need to be out there. We need to be out there talking on social media. It it's, can be disconcerting when you see RDs saying things that, you know, maybe not be evidence-based. And you're going to see that, just like you'll see doctors. But that's why we need to be out there uh, giving out good information. Look at, look at the one second from the bottom, or the two in the middle. Respond promptly to media requests. This goes back to what I was saying. They want it, and they want it now. You can, can you say, give me an hour? Yeah, I do that a lot. A lot of times I'll have somebody email me and they'll say, can you talk now? And I'm like, I can talk with you in an hour if you send me a PDF of the study, if I'm not doing something else. And sometimes if I can't, I'll just say no, I can't. Okay. Um, so acting promptly is really, really important. Um, plain writing. Uh, I think you guys are going to have my media class, my communications class. Yeah, so we're going to talk a lot about this, and it's going to drive you nuts. 
in my class because you're going to say you're telling me to do all the things that Carlton's telling me not to do when you're writing your scientific reports. We do the opposite. So it's kind of opposite day in my class because we're taking it down to writing in a totally different way and it's hard because it's really the opposite of what you're supposed to do in um, a lot of your other classes. So it's hard. Okay, so these are, um, these are those guidelines. And again, I can provide these slides to you if you would like. The idea here is to make things simple without simplifying it to the point that it's inaccurate or not giving people useful information. So when you're talking to the media, a couple of things that you should do um, is focus it down to three or four key messages. Uh, I don't write these out anymore. I used to. When you start out, it's a good idea to actually write them out, especially if you're going on TV in a live interview, because if they start to sway you away from your message, you could just revert back to these three or four key messages that you have and you're fine okay so think about your messages and your talking points and how you want to frame it you guys already kind of know this but this is hard to get away from I find myself still reverting to sometimes this technical talk and I have to catch myself okay so instead of saying serum glucose we say blood sugar instead of LDL bad cholesterol not hypertension high blood pressure so things like that Okay, so yeah, I think you guys kind of know that. Um, one of the comments that I got when I was teaching my communications class a couple summers ago is one of the students, when she was writing up um, her uh, assignment, she said, um, I really hated doing this because after I read what I wrote, and I have you, what I teach you how to do is how to evaluate it to be on a sixth to eighth grade reading level, getting rid of passive senses, all the stuff. And when you get it down to there, I had a student who said, now I sound really stupid. <laughs> And I thought that was really funny uh, because, you know, the point is not for us to, s yes, we want to sound smart, but using technical jargon doesn't make you sound smarter, okay? And so you're not going to sound smart, I mean, you're not going to sound stupid when you're relaying this information in a simplified way. People appreciate it. Even people with really high education levels, I mean, I've had people that have law degrees and have said, I don't understand this. Can you, can you explain it to me? Because it's not in their area. So even people with pretty high levels of education appreciate things explained in a simple way. So when you're going out there in the media, keeping things short and sweet, uh, thinking about the kinds of messages that you want to say, keeping things vivid, though, keeping things kind of exciting, that's a, that can be a challenge, right? Um, and again, I'm going to kind of go through this fast because we're getting low on time. Be very clear as you look at the evidence. Is there no evidence that's supporting this? Is there evidence, but it's not that great? Is the evidence mixed? You know, so, so really think about that. And remember that even even if there is one study that shows something and it's a pretty good study, we look at the body of the work. So I'm always really careful, even if there's this great randomized controlled trial that shows that, let's say, olive oil lowers your risk of heart disease, I'm going to say, you know, this is one study. And as the studies, you know, as we get more and more, these messages may change. Okay, so it's really important to be honest about that. Um, and we've already talked about this. I'm going to kind of speed through this again. You know, what kind of study was it formulating that and describing the statistics accurately? You know, what can we say when somebody says, oh, that, that increased my risk of breast cancer by 26%? Well, that actually meant one extra case in 1,000 women a year. Now, again, that may be enough for somebody to stop taking that hormone replacement therapy based on their personal history, and that's fine. But we want our patients and, the, and consumers to make decisions on accurate information. That's my goal with my patients. It may not be the choice that I would make, but if they're making it on accurate evidence-based information, that's the most important thing. Okay? I have a lot of folks that say, oh, I don't I don't want to drink milk or I don't want to drink almond milk. I'm going to get all my, I'm going to get all my calcium from plant foods and not from supplements or where, wherever. It's like, well, that's unlikely that you're going to get it all from plant foods. So we need to go dairy or supplements or almond milk or something like that. So really explaining that um, to people. And of course, people hear a lot of information from friends, family, right? All kinds of, all kinds of people. So I'm going to speed through these. Uh, 
this gets back to some to Jennifer your question and maybe some other questions personalize things but I'm really big on honoring autonomy what do people want where are their values what are their belief systems and this kind of goes back to what you were talking about um, I get questions on diet sodas a lot um, I'll have somebody say to me gosh you know, my, my neighbor or my doctor said to me that that Diet Coke's gonna kill me. I have a diet soda with lunch. I really enjoy it. It makes my lunch a lot more pleasant, but now I feel like I have to stop. And you know what I tell them? I say, you know what? The evidence shows that that one diet soda is fine. It's not going to kill you, so please continue doing that. Now, I might have somebody say, I don't, I've, I don't feel like you know, they're artificial. They might be bad for me. I don't want to do it. Well, there's no particular health benefit from it. That's fine. You don't have to drink it. There are many other things that you can drink. So if you choose not to, that's a fine choice as well. Now, I don't want them going around telling other people that it's, it's going to kill them, right? Don't take other people's pleasure away. Let's be accurate with this. So if it still concerns you, that's fine. Let's talk about some other options. Maybe iced tea, green tea, something like that that's healthy for you, but also low in calories. This is where your personal biases come in. We all have, don't we all have things that we do that are healthy, right? We all eat. We all like the way we eat, most of us. We believe in it. It works for us. Why won't it work for everybody else? Well, people have different lifestyles, different challenges, barriers, values, traditions, cultures. All of those things come into play here. We really have to honor that. Different um, uh, amounts of money that they make, how much money you make has a lot to do with how you eat. So please um, really think about that. I, uh, there's a wonderful dietitian and I'll have to find her website. She's vegan and she really promotes vegan eating, but she also does it in a really accurate way. She basically says if you are choosing if you are choosing a vegan diet and that's important to you, I can show you how to do that. She's not out there telling everybody that everybody should be vegan and it's the only way to be healthy. And I really respect the way she honors autonomy and says, you know what, I can help you. Here are the potential benefits. But she's also really honest about the research and doesn't over-exaggerate what a vegan diet's going to do for you. And I really like her style. Uh, so it's okay to have your thing. If you are vegan and you really want to promote that, you can do that in an accurate evidence-based way. So whatever your thing is, you can be that, but you can also do it in a way that's honoring the evidence and honoring autonomy. And we all want to be enthusiastic about nutrition and the things that we see, but again, really make a commitment to um, accuracy and evidence. And promote it's yes we want to be hopeful but we don't want to promote hype and you know when we see headlines that say this is a miracle this is a cure this is the one big thing that's going to fix obesity they're usually wrong and so we have to really tamp down that that idea that this is going to save everybody because it's probably not you know so we can be enthusiastic but also accurate and offer people hope with again without hyping the headlines, okay? And that, I think, is all I've got for you today. Any comments, questions? Yes? Um, to what extent do you think that like, major food companies and dairy and meat industry influence like, the media? Yeah. How do food companies influence media? I don't know how much they influence media. I think they influence policy, you know, lobbying and all that sort of thing. My feeling on that is that you know we, we kind of have this expectation that food companies it's their job to make us healthier I think we need to be very pragmatic in what a food company is there for they're there to make money and so I have sort of mixed feelings about food companies I think sometimes we expect them to do things that I think are a little bit ridiculous um, I think they do need to have regulations about you know this is why I think we have labeling regulations about what they can say because they would be really they would take things pretty crazy right um, but consumers drive it you know McDonald's many many years ago McDonald's was offering carrot sticks do you remember this I don't know if you might you might even be too young to remember this they were offering carrot sticks and then they stopped why did they stop 
because nobody was buying them, right? Do you go to McDonald's for carrot sticks? I don't. I'm going to eat carrot sticks regularly, but I go. I, their fries are great. That's what I'm going to eat, right? And so I think it's a two-way street where it's very consumer-driven. So I think that food companies can influence it. I think their influence... I'm not sure how much they influence the media because they get a lot of backlash in media. But I think they do influence policy and, um, you know, yeah, on, on, in Washington. If any of you read Marion Nessel, do you guys know who Marion Nessel is? She wrote the book Food Politics. She's, um, she started out as a biochemist and she's a uh, registered dietitian. I think she's at New York University. She's up in the Northeast. And she writes a lot. She used to be actually in the federal government working on uh, policy. And now she's at um, a university. But if you're interested in that, she's a wonderful, wonderful person to read. Wonderful person to read. Yes. Um, so, sort of kind of like Jen's question, how we, do we respond to dietitians who are um, promoting bad research, but how do we respond to people in the just general public who call themselves nutritionists? Yeah. Who just have food blogs or whatever who promote yeah. information. Um, so, I'll tell you how I do it. Um, <laughs> if I see something on Twitter, if I see something on Facebook, I will directly challenge people. But I have some criteria. I do not do ad hominem attacks. Um, you know, staying away from name calling. I'm very specific about how I say that. Um, if it's somebody that's out, it's, it's not a colleague of mine, um, but I will challenge colleagues as well because I'm very passionate about this. So I will often, if it's on uh, social media, I think it's fair game for you to go, you know what, this is not right. There, this study shows this, but you have to kind of think about where you want your voice to be. There is a, there's a Canadian dietitian on Twitter, and I really love her, but I would never, do you guys know Abby Langer? Anybody who's on, do you know, she's pretty bold, isn't she? Do you, she's, and I'm like, man, I really admire that, but I don't want to do that, you know, because she can be pretty bold and I tend to agree with her but I'm like man she she can be pretty hard hitting and pointed if any of you are on Twitter look her up she's kind of fun to follow her and she gets a lot of hits you know if if you want to get a lot of likes and things you know being a loud kind of uh, boisterous voice can work very well but I also kind of shy away from that I'm pretty strong in my responses but I'm also very big on you know, this is what the evidence shows. Am I going to convince a lot of people? Maybe, maybe not. And I think that's where we have to realize you're not going to convince everybody. If you're dead set on convincing everybody, you're going to be really disappointed. So you have to kind of go, you know what? I'm going to be a voice of reason. Let the chips fall where they may. Now, if it's a corporation, I tend to be a little nastier. If it's out there and it's, I could show you some things I've posted on Facebook and been pretty, not again, still no ad hominem attacks. I'm not going to name call. I'm still pretty careful, but I'll be a little, a little louder, a little more aggressive in if it's somebody selling a product and it's a corporation, you know, like Goop, Gwyneth Paltrow, you know, that's really fair game to me, <laughs> you know. So I kind of have my, you know, I don't want to attack a person. You know, so I'm not going to attack, but I am going to say, this is what the data actually show. And you have to be open yourself up for getting criticized, too, because you will. You will. Jennifer, did you have a question? I thought your hand was raised. I'm going to piggyback on Maggie's question. Um, they actually, so Coca-Cola, the big industry and everything, they hired somebody from Harvard with a big title and everything like that that um, was... I think he was a dietitian, but they actually paid him to say, like, Coca-Cola has no correlation with raising your blood sugars, like, at all. And the Harvard yeah. ended up publishing that. And, um, and they had some backlash to that, didn't right. they? Yeah. So Harvard, like, after, you know, they looked at the research, Harvard had to write, like, an apology letter to the public. Mm -hmm. and I think it's, in, did everybody hear that? that, did that yeah, um, she was talking about how Coca-Cola actually hired a nutrition professional with, you know, to, to, to say that there's no correlation between Coke and obesity, blood sugars, things of that nature. And I think it's really good to be a voice out there and challenge that. I hope you do. It's figure out how to be that voice in doing it in a way, 
I, I try to, my personal approach is try to be kind in the way that we communicate. It's not always easy to do that. And I don't always follow that, especially if it is a big corporation. Um, but be accurate. Always fall back on this is what the study actually shows. This is what studies actually show. And I disagree with this, and this is why. And if you do go out there and you have your kind of set of criteria that you use, it helps you to brace yourself against, against criticism. Yeah. How many of you are interested in doing, I know you're out there, who's out there kind of doing this, uh, wanting to do it? How many of you would like to, like if somebody, if a reporter called you and said, would you come on TV or do an interview, would you do it? So you would do it, would you do it? Yeah, yeah, good. Maybe more of you. Yeah, I'm sorry, you wouldn't say. Yeah, that's okay. Um, another thing like about <coughs> thoughts on research that may have outcomes that seem or like results that seem valid but have like bias back in the research I think it's really that's a very good question her question was what about corporate funded research um, we are at a time where it's very hard to get research dollars and I think that my personal feeling on it is that we need corporate dollars and there is a way to do it with transparency. <coughs> so what I would tell you, don't assume, and be very careful, don't assume that because something is industry funded that it is automatically biased. And you'll see consumers, people, oh, it was funded by Coca-Cola, therefore it must be a bad study. No. Uh, there was a, a well-done study that showed that eating an avocado a day lowered LDLs. Who was that funded by? The avocado board. Did that make it automatically a bad study? No. Now, it was a whole avocado every day. <laughs> Who can do that, right? But that being said, if you looked at the study itself, <coughs> excuse me, it was a well-done study. So I would say do not assume that if it's corporate funded, that it is automatically biased. Look at what the structure of that agreement was. And if you have agreements where, many universities are doing this, but they put in these agreements where the corporation has to essentially say that the study's conclusions and what you publish, we have absolutely no say in that. Okay? And so you have to look at what was, what was the corporate agreement? What was the structure of that? So I'm very big on, on you know, you'll, you'll see people who say, well, it must not be a good study because it was funded by this corporation. It's not how it works. Okay? So might it be? It might. But look at all the fraudulent stuff that we saw that was, you know, researchers can be fraudulent just because they want to make a name for themselves, have their studies have an impact, all this kind of stuff. So... There's, there's fraud going on across the board there, okay? Does that make sense? Any co other comments on that? So be real careful with that, not to just dismiss that. Look at the quality. Harriet, can you comment on that? Well, I have a comment in, in talking about corporations and think that uh, everybody should really be very uh, knowledgeable about the code of ethics that uh, the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics has and uh, actually those of you that are already registered dietitians in getting your, <coughs> your, getting your hours, you know, you have to have so much of your continuing education hours <coughs> delegated to ethics. And mm -hmm. the whole corporate <coughs> is, is something to be very careful about, mm -hmm. I think. And it was a tremendous issue in the association several years ago when uh, Somehow, uh, it looked like we were advocating a certain kind of cheese. Oh, yes. The craft yeah. cheese. It was the American singles, right? What was going on within the dietary community about that cheese issue. <laughs> yeah. And, and, you know, and, and it brought up the whole issue of, of funding of projects and scholarships within the association. So I think from a just a practical aspect, you have to be careful. Mm -hmm. And I think there are many, many, many dietitians that are working in the corporate world now. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I just 
Yeah, program. that's a very good point. So your go back to your ethics statements and and. Um, and then also be transparent. I mean, because people are going to find out, right? <laughs> so, so be transparent about it. You know, this was funded by, and if people are transparent, but I think it's a two-way street because I think what you're going to see is we are going to be relying more and more on, on corporate funding. It can be done well, but it's got to be open, transparent, and there's got to be a very clear set of guidelines, criteria that everybody follows. Yeah, it's a very, very good question. I would still say that if you're commenting on the study, say, this study was funded by, that may give you pause, but if you look at the study, it was well done, or it wasn't well done, or they exaggerate. So again, that's where your judgment comes in. Yeah. Other comments? You guys are asking really good questions. Other comments? Yeah. Does the peer review process kind of help filter through some of that? The peer review process does and doesn't. If you've ever peer reviewed something, and I've done a few, but not a lot. Um, you don't often see all of the way that the data was gathered. You're seeing what they're presenting to you. It helps, but now you're also seeing a lot of open access journals these days. And um, so that comes to play in it. So it is important to say this was presented in a good peer review journal. That brings up something that's not a direct answer uh, to your question. Uh, I'm seeing a lot of things being reported on where the research study was presented at a meeting but has not been published. Do you guys see that sometimes? Where a reporter went to a meeting and somebody was presenting their data, it has not been peer reviewed, published in a journal, and they're reporting on it. A lot of people say, you know what? That should not be reported on. That has not been peer reviewed, has not been published, has not gone through that process. So that kind of speaks to what you're talking about. Peer review process helps, but when you look, all those studies from, I don't know if Wansink stuff was peer re in peer reviewed journals or not, but you'll see stuff that gets through peer reviewed journals that then is discovered to have been fraudulent in some way. It's kind of hard to pick up sometimes, yes. Yeah. So it helps a lot. It's good. It's not a guarantee. It's not a guarantee. Yeah. Good questions. Anything else? Anything else? All right. Thank you guys so much. I look forward to having a bunch of you in my um, class.